to the observed what global warming. This is it's, the consensus, my friend. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think that's true. I mean, no. the way I'd look at this is we've come into this century that we're in now in reasonably good shape. There's a chance we might get out of it in reasonably good shape. But the only way we're going to get out of this century in reasonably good shape, I think, is if we really tackle the link between energy growth and emissions growth. And that's why I was very interested by what Nikki was saying, because coal, in my view, is going to have to be a very significant part of that. We're not talking about the need for a global revolution. The smart business leaders, like Greg used to be, and there are many who we used to work with when I was working at Number 10 and we're working with now, they know, and you may throw up Dan Estes' book, but they know that low-carbon growth is smart growth, and, and low-carbon growth need not bankrupt the global economy at all, but is actually a positive way to promote more sustainable growth. OK, I can hear the audience saying, what about the audience? I do want, I know, I will come with to you in a moment. I just, there's one final sort of section of the program we haven't dealt with, and that is Durkin's underlying political thesis uh, that global warming science will, in fact, penalise the uh, third world economies, uh, restricting their access to cheap power, denying them the right of economic development. Uh, Nikki Williams, I know that you have something to say on that. Look, I, I, I certainly don't think it's global warming science that's going to deprive the third world of uh, uh, its capacity to develop. I think uh, where we have to be extremely careful uh, are the policies that we adopt in order to mitigate uh, for the impacts of climate change. Um, we need to recognise that as the film said, two billion people on the planet don't have a, a humble electric light bulb. Our population is going to go from six and a half billion to nine billion in the next 30 years. Electrification is key to development and we're going to have to uh, ensure that the people in the developing world have access to the means that removes them from, from poverty. And that will only come through power. And the reality is that fossil fuels, and particularly coal, are so widely available and so competitively priced that they will be used by the developing world. China alone is building 500 new coal-fired power stations over the next 10 years. Every four days, China is opening a new power station. Now, that's a very significant reality. So the sort of low emission technologies that need to be adopted to make sure that the emissions <coughs> growth is, is slowed is absolutely essential because we cannot allow policies which actually uh, continue to, uh, to exacerbate the divide between the developed and developing world. It's our responsibility to make sure not that we stop development but that we uh, ensure development is consistent with what the planet environmentally requires. OK, well, we have a uh, fractious and an engaged audience and uh, it is time to give them uh, the final part of the program to have their say and also to ask questions of the panel, restricted of the panel if you can. I'll start mm -hmm. with this gentleman on the end here who has his hand up. Thank you. Uh, to our uh, garrulous sceptic uh, friend in the middle there, our my question is, if you're using uh, m millions of years or billions of years, even in the age of coal and uh, the, the, uh, the substance itself is now under question, they've found carbon-14 in copious measurable amounts in, in, in coal. So we've got to qu ask the question about the age of coal itself. Th that's a huge one that's just come out in 70 reports. Even the US Coal Board has announced oh, we've found carbon-14 in coal, rewrites your whole underlying assumptions of the whole age factor in this, in this principle and all the statistics based on these so-called ages and uh, millennia, out by, by magnitudes in factors they're now discovering. Number two, there's a, a United Nations treaty on okay, the banning sorry, of weather warfare. Let's, let's just stick to one because there's sure, a lot of people okay. who want to say, who did you direct that to? I, was Our garrulous friend in the middle. David Caroli. I yeah. actually have no idea what the question was. Okay. okay. <laughs> Carbon-14 mm, okay. in coal means right, it's right. nothing to do with okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you because I'm, unfortunately I Thank didn't you. quite understand you either. <laughs> uh, there is a question right up the back there. We'll take that one first. The I, very, at the very back. Me? Yes. I'd like to take the, the debate into another question. I mean, we've been debating the science here. We've not debated anything in terms of the credibility of the environmentalist movement. The environmentalist movement was formed by Sir Julian Huxley, who was the founder of the Eugenics Society. The WWF and, and these other organisations are actually offspins from that Eugenics Society. Now, what Martin Durkin is saying, that this has huge implications for the, for the developing countries. What the, I mean, is that the intention behind this whole environmentalist scam behind global warming swindle? 
Uh, look, I'll just quickly throw that one to Greg Bourne, since he is an environmentalist <laughs> and a former businessman. I, I think if I were to uh, talk to my colleagues in Nepal, Bhutan, uh, the Congo, those parts which are very, very poor, those colleagues in China, those parts, colleagues in India, who very definitely have grown up looking <coughs> Uh, ease poverty, how do we find a way forward for this world and how do we manage the environment and economy at the same time? The world has moved on from that debate. This is a very, very sophisticated, understanding group of people who are passionately caring about people and the environment and the economy. Okay, I'm, I'll go back to the audience. We'll try and keep them short. Uh, this gentleman in the white sweater there. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask the gentleman there, the uh, one, two, three, four from the left? You mentioned these two... Uh, <laughs> I think that's you, Michael Duffy. <laughs> you, held, you held up a book and a uh, pamphlet. Now, uh, what was your objection to embracing new business opportunities in renewable energy? I, I have uh, no objection to that. I think it's entirely rational behaviour. My point was simply that we shouldn't assume that simply because hard-headed business people are doing this, it, they're doing it solely or only because they're convinced by the science. They may be convinced by the move in public opinion or the move in government regulations, for example. But it Couldn't would be part the of the insurance policy, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's entirely rational behaviour. OK, uh, in the middle there with the scarf around your shoulder. Uh, Fiona Wayne, Environment Business Australia. There's a couple of points I'd like to make. First of all, there's a subliminal messaging in this film that, that organisations like NASA are involved in this swindle. Um, and I'd like to read to you a line from James Hansen's recent report, which says <coughs> that greenhouse gas emissions place the Earth perilously close to dramatic climate change that could run out of control. Only intense simultaneous efforts to slow CO2 emissions and reduce non-CO2 forcings can keep climate within or near the range of the past million years. Now, to answer Mike Duffy's point, yes, there is a whole new industry that is developing. It's called the clean tech industry, the clean energy industry. And it's backed by $41 trillion of funds under management from the Carbon Disclosure Pro Project. Companies who really want to see commercial activity not beating the earth into submission, not creating waste and pollution, but making money by doing good. And this can also bring poverty <laughs> levels. Um, reduce poverty levels in developing countries by providing people with clean energy. I um, mean, yes, clean coal is one step forward. Okay. But we've got things like solar thermal energy. Spain's just opened a plant. Nevada took 15 months to get their first solar thermal plant up and running. We can do the same time and time and time again. OK, I, I'll take that as a statement and we'll move on. There's a, another person down the front here with his hand up. We'll go down to the front. We haven't been down there yet. Uh, the gentleman with the hat. <laughs> All right, um, I'm a... So I study economics, physical economics and astrophysics and also classical music under Lyndon LaRouche. And the question I would like to have with the so-called scientist on the panel is 400 years ago, Johannes Kepler, the man that discovered universal gravity, actually refuted the method of the IPCC report of statistical analysis as being like Plato's cave of seeing the shadows on the wall and there you got you know, Tony doing the happy dance in front of the, uh, you know, the fire being reality, but these guys are just looking at the statistics of what they're seeing, empirically seeing, and that's, that's true for them. Now, Johannes Kepler actually proved that the previous models before that as actually being incorrect in the sense of method-wise. Now, this has been a general trend for 30 years since okay, the boom of drugs, sex, rock, uh, and roll. I think, uh, I'm sorry. So what's, what's your com comment on that, the two, uh, the geologists and the IPCC? <laughs> I, I, have a feel, I have a feeling that's a slightly <laughs> obscure uh, point to be making here. Well, and, well uh, method I'm, is very important. I, I, I understood. Maybe we can carry it It's the it crux later. of it. This gentleman up here who has his hand up in the third from the last uh, row. Why won't they answer it? I, I have a, a point on, on the environmental movement in general, a question for any of the environmentalists, so-called, in, in the panel there. Uh, Prince Philip was one of the key founders of the Green Movement. He said that if he were to be reincarnated, he'd want to be reincarnated into a deadly virus to solve the overpopulation problem. <laughs> well, the point is that the Green Movement was founded by those in the eugenics movement. This is Hitler, Nazi race science, and this will destroy Africa. Can, can anyone make a comment? 
Uh, look, I think, I think we'll just leave that as a statement if we can. Uh, and can we actually go to the